If you uh, have a Bible, I invite you to turn with me to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 1. As you know, we're, um, we started uh, last week a new sermon series on God's grace for saints. And um, today, uh, last week, we looked at God's, um, what was it, God's generous gospel. And uh, today, we want to look at God's glorious gospel. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 through 10. I want to talk to you today about uh, two things. Don't, don't desert God and uh, don't desire glory. Don't desert God and don't desire glory. Let's, uh, let's look, and look at the word of God. Uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse, uh, verse 6. Please hear God's word. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. God's glorious gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is uh, glorious. You know that. Um, the gospel uh, we saw last week, the gospel is about the grace of God. It's about the grace of God revealed through Jesus Christ. You and I were born spiritually bankrupt. We had gone into foreclosure long ago. Um, we owed a lot. We were spiritually bankrupt. We were unwilling and unable to obey God. We didn't care about God. That's true about all of us. But Jesus gave himself for our sins. He gave himself for our sins. And, and we don't deserve this, and we could never do anything to earn it. Jesus became, as we saw last week in chapter 3, Jesus became a curse because of our disobedience so that we might be justified by faith in Jesus alone. Nothing added. Why did he do it? The Bible tells us, we can, you know, it's a little review. The Bible tells us he did it in verse, uh, verse 4, of chapter 1, he gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. That's why he did it. This has to do with the other aspect of the gospel that Paul preaches. It has to do with peace. Prior to being saved, you were at war with God. You were at war with, with each other. And um, God was at war with each one of us. Um, but, but God sent his son, it was God's idea, to send his son Jesus Christ to die for our sins and to give his life up and to, to receive the wrath of God upon himself so that, so that you and I might have peace with God, that we might have peace with each other, that, that we might not be broken into pieces by God, but we might have peace with God and the peace of God. And... Uh, Prior to, to knowing Jesus Christ, our lives are broken. Our lives are shattered into pieces. And, and the peace of the gospel, the shalom of the gospel, means that you were broken and God came and made you whole through the gospel. He put you back together again. And that's what, that's what the gospel does. It puts you back together again. Jesus Christ rescues us. We talked about how he rescues us from the present evil age. This age that we live in is characterized by hatred, by self-love, by self-centered service, by self-worship. And 
Jesus came to turn all of that around by adopting us into his family and giving us his spirit. He enables us to respond in loving service to the God who has loved us and served us. Jesus came to put our lives back together. And Paul preached this gospel, and God confirmed this message with great signs and miraculous wonders. And the people in Galatian, Galatian churches, uh, they ate it up. They believed it. They got saved. Uh, they started worshiping God and rejoicing in God. They saw the miracles that God did through his apostles, and, and they, they, they loved the gospel. But then something happened. Something happened that totally astonished the Apostle Paul. Uh, the Bible talks about it. It's what we read. Um, the Galatians were deserting God. They were deserting the same God who called them by His grace. They were deserting uh, the one who in Christ justified them and, and declared them righteous and declared them innocent. They were deserting the one who, who in Christ lifted the curse off of them. They were deserting the one who, who set them free from the law of Moses. They were deserting the same one who, who set them free from the dominating power of sin. They were deserting the one who made them a brand new creation. That in Christ Jesus they had all of these blessings and all of these wonders that God had done and they were deserting God, the God of grace. They were turning away from him. They were turning, it says, they were turning to a different gospel, which uh, was not gospel. It wasn't good news. Because what they were turning to, they were turning to circumcision. In order, in order to, uh, they were receiving circumcision in order to persuade God to love them. So they had been saved. They had already received the justifying grace of God and and now they were turning back to the law of Moses to obey the law in order to convince God to bless them. They, they were turning back to off observing special days and, and special seasons and special years and special months. They were doing these things to persuade God to accept them. They were turning to a specific diet. Because they thought that eating a certain type of food and eating with a certain group of people would make you more pleasing and more acceptable to God. They were turning to a different gospel, which was not a gospel at all. And they were doing this, it says, uh, all because, it says this in Acts chapter 15, verse 1 and verse 5. They were doing this because some men came from Judea and were teaching them, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. That's why they were doing it. They were being bullied by these people from Jerusalem. And the guys from Jerusalem said it is necessary to keep the law of Moses in order for God to accept you and welcome you. That's what they were being taught. You see, Paul had evangelized this place, and like many have said, these guys came to do follow-up. They did follow up on Paul's evangelism and what they heard was that, that Paul had taught them that, that you can be justified, you can be accepted by God simply and only by trusting in what Christ has done for you. That's it. That's all you have to do. That's what Paul preached. Just believe in the crucified, resurrected Savior and God will save you and God will change you. That's the gospel. And when they heard that, what they said, oh, no, no, you have to get circumcised first. You have to become a Jew first, and then you can become a Christian. You've got to keep the law of God. You've got to keep up appearances. You've got to keep on working as hard as you can. And maybe when Judgment Day shows up, God will accept you. you know, that's what they were teaching. That's what they were promoting. That's what they were preaching. And, and what this amounts to, what they were saying basically, is that the blood of Jesus Christ is not enough. The sacrifice on the cross was good, but it's not good enough. That, that, that the giving up of the Son of God's life blood is an unclean thing. We're Jewish. That's unclean. Blood is unclean. And you've got to do something else to win God's approval. And, and essentially what they were doing is they were throwing the gospel out the window and saying it doesn't matter. You've got to obey in order for God to save you. That was their message. And, and Paul's response to these preachers 
Uh, Paul's, Paul's reaction to these preachers, uh, he says it two times. His, his message to, to, to these preachers who preach Jesus plus your works for salvation. Paul's message to them is that may God damn them. That's his message. That's what it means, anenthema. May you be eternally damned by God. That's a serious message. Because Paul's message to them was, don't you dare desert the God who calls you by grace. And Paul is serious. He's irate. He doesn't have any thanksgiving in this letter. And his message is, may God curse these people. That's his prayer. It's a malediction. He's very serious about it. He says it twice in in case people thought, well, Paul, you're just, you know, you're taking this a little bit too much. You're getting too emotional about this. And Paul says, I'm not emotional at all. May God curse them. That was his message to them. And it's the same message God gives to us who, whoever would try to change the message of the gospel. We, 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 we read this and we say, well, that's harsh. You know, that's, that's, that's kind of offensive. And, you know, that's, that, you know it's, it's meant to make you uncomfortable. That's the point. Paul's message here is meant to make you squirm in your seat and, and, and do inventory on your own heart and say, am, am I buying into a different gospel? Am I preaching to myself? A different gospel? Am I adding something to to my life and to my works and saying that by this God is going to accept me more or God will God will bless me more if I if I do this? And so so we're 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 essentially saying to God that Jesus is is insufficient. He's optional. That's the culture we live in. You know, we're told to be uh, tolerant in this culture of everybody's viewpoint. And um and I believe in tolerance. I believe, I believe, I believe people have misinterpreted what to- tolerance means. See, if you, if you have a different view than mine and I, I cut your head off, uh, that means I'm not tolerant. But if you have a different view of mine and I, I, I say, okay, I pray for you, and I, when you are open to talk, I talk with you, and I live my life before you, and I don't treat you mean or dirty because your viewpoint is different. I just pray for you and live my Christian life. That's being tolerant. Um, isn't that right? Um, but but, but what, these people, what these people were saying was that Jesus is insufficient for salvation. And um, I can find meaning, and I can find meaning for my existence apart from Jesus. And, and, and essentially what they're saying was that Jesus was a fraud. He's not, he's, he can't live up to his own name. His name means Savior, because he saves his people from their sins. But they're saying he can't do it without your help. And um, what they were essentially saying is that God's grand design of grace is incomplete. After all that God does, he still needs you to help him finish the job. What they were basically saying is that those who get up and proclaim this this true gospel of Christ Jesus and and salvation in Jesus alone, it's just hot air. You've got to do the work yourself. You've got to add something to Jesus to be saved. And so often today today in the church, we we buy the lie, right? Don't we? We, we buy the lie that, that going to church, coming to church, will actually increase our status before God. Sometimes we buy that lie. Sometimes we buy the lie that giving tithes and giving offerings is somehow going to make me more acceptable to God. Somehow we, we buy into the lie that if I do a daily devotional or I have a daily prayer time, that, that, that somehow I'm going to get closer to, to God than I already am in Christ Jesus. Sometimes we buy into the lie that if I, if I get good grades or if I, if I ace all my tests, that somehow I'll be in a better position for God to bless me. And so we add it to Jesus. And somehow we, we, somehow we believe that um, if I serve God and if I love others, somehow God is going to welcome me better than he would in Jesus alone. And we, we buy the lie that if I, if I just stay off of drugs and if I just don't get pregnant before I get married, somehow God's going to love me more. 
If I'm baptized, I'll be more accepted by God. Or if I, if I take the Lord's Supper, somehow I'll be more secure in my relationship with God. And, and in all of these things, we're, we're basically saying that I've got to do something else besides what Christ has done to find more acceptance with God and to really secure my life with God. I've got to do something. And that what Jesus did is not sufficient. It's not enough. And Paul said that if you preach that gospel to yourself, it's a different gospel. It's not good news. It's bad news. And um, do you ever preach a different gospel to yourself? I find sometimes I preach a different gospel to myself. That if sometimes I don't have a good prayer time with God, somehow my relationship is a little bit broken with God. And that if I didn't do my daily devotion today, that somehow God is annoyed with me, or upset with me, or he's going to go come get me. And uh, we got all of these things that we ri raise up to God, and, and we say that I've got to add this to what Jesus has done. And, and we elevate things above the work of Christ. And we say that this is the reason why God's going to accept me. And if you, if you spend time throughout your day telling yourself, I've got to do this, I've got to do this, I, I've got to get this done, I've got to accomplish this, and, and you, you, you're just like a hamster on a treadmill. You're just spinning the wheel, and you're not going anywhere. Right? You're just spinning. Do you ever see a hamster on a treadmill? It's fun to watch. It's fun to watch if you're a human and it's a hamster. But when you're on the treadmill, it's not fun. And, and you've got an you've got you've axe to grind. You've got things to do. And you've got an agenda to keep. And you've got stuff you've got to get accomplished. Because if you don't, your life has no meaning. You've got to get a girlfriend. You've got to get a boyfriend. Right? You've got to get married. You've got to get, you gotta, you gotta get a baby, something, to add meaning to my life. And, and, and God's saying, this all, all this stuff is idolatry. I've got, I've got to make a certain amount of money, you know. I've got, to, I've got to keep the house. I've got to, you know, I've got to work my fingers to the bone. And you set up all of these laws and rules in your life. And they, it's slavery. And we tell ourselves, we beat ourselves up. And what we should be telling us is that, look what God did for me in Jesus Christ. This is the foundation. This is where we begin. This is how we start laying the foundation in our life for a gospel-centered life. It's what, what has God done for me in Christ Jesus? My identity is in Jesus Christ. I'm adopted by the King. I'm a brand new creation. I'm filled with the Spirit of God. My righteousness is sitting on a throne in heaven. Jesus is interceding for me. God loves me. He, you know, what did Jesus say? I, my sheep hear my voice. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. Nobody can pluck them out of my hand. My father is greater than all and nobody can pluck them out of my father's hand. Didn't Jesus say that? Didn't Paul say that God is for you and who can be against you? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, right? How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elected? Is God who justifies, who can condemn Christ Jesus, the one who died? More than that, who was raised, who's at the right hand of God, who's interceding for us? What can separate you from the love of Christ? Right? All these wonderful promises. There's nothing in all of creation that can separate you from the love of Christ. And yet we elevate stuff above that. And we say, I've got to get this to get happiness. I've got to get this to get meaning. I've got to get this to have purpose. I have to get this to really count in life. And what God says is that you already count. You're my child. Through Jesus Christ, trust me. Put the kingdom first. I'll take care of the rest of your needs. Isn't that what Jesus promised? Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Everything else will be added to you. Sometimes we put beauty self-esteem, all kinds of things to feel good about ourselves. Um, what could possibly be more pleasing and acceptable to God than Jesus Christ? What could possibly be more pleasing and acceptable to God than the righteous, wrath-absorbing, curse-bearing, blood-sacrifice of the Son of God? Nothing could be more pleasing to God than Jesus. You cannot do anything to make God love you more. And your failures as a follower of Jesus Christ will never make God love you less. 
Because God's love is not rooted in you. God's love is rooted in his own character. His love is rooted in what he did in, in Christ Jesus to redeem you. His love has nothing to do with you. His love has everything to do with himself. Um, do you believe that? The reason, that, the reason why we serve, the reason why we love, the reason why we, we joyfully obey is not because somehow we think we can add to what Christ has done and, and gain more acceptance. You know, I actually met a person who thought they were more special as a Christian than other Christians. They thought they had like a special, a special line to God more than everybody else in the body of Christ. And sometimes we buy into that lie that, that somehow because of some experience in my life, God must look at me as a cut above the rest of his people. And, and how, I mean, how tragic is that sort of viewpoint? That's so foolish. I mean, everybody in here is lost without Jesus Christ. And everybody in here with Christ Jesus is justified. Everybody is looked at the same by God. We're, we're all just as righteous and sinless as Jesus Christ through faith in him alone. And that nobody's better than anybody. The only reason I'm standing up on this thing is so that you can see me. <laughs> so no one's better. No one's better off. We're all in this together. And, 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 and what, what motivates us uh, is the love of God, the love of Christ. We respond to grace. We don't supplement grace. God doesn't need our help. He's a savior all by himself. So don't desert God. And, and lastly, and, you know, briefly, don't desire glory. Uh, what Paul says here is in verse 10, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God, or am I trying to please man, or um, am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. This is about serving Jesus and not seeking glory, not seeking the praise of man. That's what this is essentially about. And Paul's message was not man-made. Uh, he didn't preach to be popular. He didn't preach to please people. Uh, Paul was not a politician. Uh, he was accused, if you turn to uh, 1 Corinthians 9, Paul was accused of pleasing people because he was misunderstood. Um, look at what it says in 1 Corinthians 9, uh, verse 19. Uh, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside of the law I became as one outside of the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I had become all things to all people, so that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I might share with them in its blessings. You know, what's, you know, what's characteristic about that, what you see repeated is in that passage, you know, it looks like Paul is pleasing all kinds of people, that he's flexing and compromising the message in order to meet certain people. But, but what's central to that passage is that Paul's doing all those things in order to win people, to win people for the gospel that he flexes his life to win people for the gospel. The gospel is his centerpiece in his life. He lives according to the gospel. He lives to proclaim the gospel. He lives and he'll, he'll bend certain things that to God don't matter in order to get the gospel message across. And um, what Paul is doing is not compromising. He's contextualizing um, because he's aiming at seeking the salvation of other people. In your life, um, how often have you, how often do you flex like that in order to get the gospel to people? Do you see yourself doing that in life, whether it's in your school or on your job? Do you find yourself flexing in order to get the message of the gospel to people and compromising, not the gospel, but compromising your own comfort, inconveniencing yourself so that somebody else can hear the gospel message? That was what Paul did. You know, remember, remember I said, for to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. If I go on living in the body, it means fruitful labor for me. He'd rather go to be with Christ, but, but he, he was alive to get the gospel to people. And the reason, why, um, the reason why we seek to please people, there's, there's three reasons uh, that Paul gives in this letter. 
One reason is because, you know, there's people in your life who have influence. There's people who have influence in your life, and you've got to please those people. If not, somehow they can make your life difficult. That's what he says in, in chapter 2. He says that Peter was afraid of the circumcision when they came to the churches in Galatia. He was afraid because they had a lot of influence, they had a lot of power, and they could do stuff. They could pull strings. And because he was afraid of them, he was willing to compromise the gospel. And that's what, that's what Paul doesn't want you to do. He doesn't want you to compromise because you're afraid of people. And sometimes we do that, right? Sometimes there's people that we know need to hear the message, but I'm afraid of what might happen if I share the message. That's a different gospel, friends. And there's, there's, a, there's another reason. He says the reason why they didn't, these guys came was because they didn't want to suffer for the gospel. It says that in chapter 6, that they didn't want to be persecuted for the gospel. But they, they wanted popularity. They wanted to be popular. And sometimes in our life, that's what, that's what we want. We, we love popularity. We want to be popular. We want everybody to like us. That's not the gospel. You know, if Jesus came to this world so everybody would like him, none of us would ever get saved. They crucified him. They hated him. You know, another reason, three reasons I'll give you why we please people is we want people to like us. Sometimes it's financial. We want people to support us. And sometimes it's, it's just we, we want fans. We want human praise. And um, don't desire that kind of glory. It all fizzes after a while. The glory that you and I should desire is the glory that only God can give. Jesus was not, was not this way. Jesus came to this world to die for our sins. He lived a righteous life so that you and I could, could receive a perfect record of obedience before God. And so often today with young people, it's about being popular. It's about fitting in. It's about being popular with the crowd. Everybody likes me. Everybody knows my name, so to speak. And and people are supportive of me because I have a lot of friends. The Bible says that he who has many friends must show himself friendly. You've got to keep compromising your values to keep your friends. But there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother, and that friend is Jesus. Jesus is the one who came and emptied his life for you and lived the perfect life for you so that one day you can walk up the holy hill of God Jesus will take you by the hand and introduce you to your father and say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over the little I gave you. Now I'm putting you over much. Amen. Uh, if we could just take a moment just to pray. Um, Alvin will close our community prayer. But if you could just pray that, that we as, as God's people would not preach a different gospel to ourselves. Not only we, we wouldn't do it in the pulpit, but you out there wouldn't preach it to your own heart on a daily basis. That we would be uh, overjoyed with what God has done in Christ. And we'd know that our acceptance is in him. And secondly, that we wouldn't live for the praise of people, but we would really live for the praise of God. Would you pray those two things? And uh, Alvin will close us.